Coffee, my name is Annalise James and today I am joined by the fabulous Surgeon Rear Admiral Lionel Jarvis. Hello. Hello Annalise. Hi. Lionel is amazing. I'm so excited for this interview. He is currently the Prior of England and the Isles of the Order of St John and the Chair of St John Ambulance. Well, thank you for coming and joining us in our um, headquarters here in it's London. amazing here. I love it. So you've got a really interesting story actually because you started... Um, studying medicine and now here we are St John Ambulance tell me a little bit more about your journey where did it start and how did you get here well of course um, Dan Lees you don't need to assume that a career in medicine is going to be predictable prescriptive or follow every other line a huge number of doctors simply uh, follow their instincts and careers to specialties and general practice and that's fantastic I guess I was uh, a little restless and thought uh, the NHS looked not terribly exciting at the time as I qualified in medicine and thought I'd join the Royal Navy for a short commission and travel around the world. And each time I considered moving on from that, it became just a little bit more exciting. Life, world events evolved. And uh, my wife, who's a NHS consultant, I'd say, is it time to leave the Royal Navy and go and do something different, perhaps in the NHS? And she'd say, for goodness sake, stay where you are, you'll be bored in 10 minutes. <laughs> so much to my surprise, more than um, anyone else's maybe, I uh, found myself surprisingly promoted and invited to take on different command roles. So I having run military radiology um, based in uh, Gosport, Royal Hospital Hasler, I was asked to take command. Mm -hmm. And I guess I must have done that okay. Good job, yeah. <laughs> um, and worked closely with the NHS then. And then I was promoted into other roles, working in the Ministry of Defence. And at a time when uh, war fighting evolved in uh, the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, I found myself in uh, at the head of the Royal Naval Medical Service and what's called Assistant Chief of the Defence Staff for Health with the extraordinary privilege of leading the medical effort operationally on behalf of the armed forces wow. in those conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that was uh, a huge privilege because thanks to the astonishing commitment, ingenuity, determination of a large number of Army, Navy and Air Force and civilian doctors, we made astonishing announced advances in trauma care wow. that had had a world-changing impact and saved lives that would never have been saved before. I was simply uh, privileged to be the conductor of that effort. And uh, took, that took me into a role where I realised that uh, it's more than just seeing patients mm. that can have an impact on medicine. And over those years, a lot of people say over and over again, don't you miss practicing medicine, Lionel, Admiral, whatever I say? <laughs> I said, I practice medicine every day of the week. Mm. I may not see patients, but I am practicing medicine, whether it's uh, influencing the running of a hospital or influencing the impact of healthcare on the battlefield. And that, of course, gives you an opportunity to travel the world and see how um, events unfold in different parts of the world, how medical communities do and don't operate together, which we can talk mm -hmm. about, international cooperation. And then in high-level strategic roles, you realise that you have to look to the future and defence planning looks at what are the future causes of conflict in the world mm. and you find yourself sucked into considering that and you realise that issues such as the impact of climate change, resource shortages, overpopulation, etc. collectively can be the causes of future conflict mm. which sucks you into an interest. So that really took me through my military career and we can perhaps and a pause, oh, talk about what I did <laughs> after that, which is two further interesting 
career adventures, which brings me to where I am now. Today. Is that a fair wow. summary of... I love that. <laughs> so there's probably not much you haven't seen. You've got such a Ooh. broad knowledge, such broad experience, and also seeing all of those cultures and all the ways different people work together, don't work together. You must just have such a catalogue of information in your brain that make you more effective, actually. Well, that's very flattering. Um, I think there's an awful lot that I haven't seen and uh, one continues to learn all the time. Uh, But yes, I think uh, one of the strengths of having a varied career with different experiences is that that gives you the ability to lead people at a senior level based upon having the experience of seeing what goes on in different cultures and environments. Mm -hmm. So, I, for example, I had a leadership role in the military, which is not what everyone thinks. Mm-hmm. The first big role I took outside uh, of the military as the chief executive and medical director of a heart hospital in Qatar, working for the Qatari royal family. The assumption was, oh, of course, you'll just get everything done because you're used to ordering people to do things. <laughs> uh, frankly, as most military officers will uh, insist... By the time it comes to giving an order, you've probably lost the game already. Mm. You actually take people with you to uh, do things because they agree that it's the right direction of travel. But what I was going to say, I had had this military background of leadership, and then I find myself running uh, quite a substantial hospital in the Middle East, in Qatar, where most of my board were local Arabs Mm. um, who were beautifully cultured, urbane, sophisticated, but totally different demeanour in terms of running a board meeting Mm. than in British government. And then I come now to running a large charity. And I think by the time you get to this one, you realise actually how much tacit learning I acquired from working out how to run a board in Mm. the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. Um, That is so different from running one in government or the NHS or in the military, that you build upon all these different experiences and suddenly find, actually, now I'm running a charity, that's different again, but you pick up the different nuances and yeah. skills of previous experience yeah. to bring to the table. And no one ever gets it right. You just learn, how do I adapt my skills to this new environment? Mm. So would you say that adaptability is one of the strongest suits that you have in terms of leadership? Or would you say you have another skill set that's enabled you to be an effective leader? You say I'm effective leader. Perhaps I've been successful. I don't know. I don't know um, what the skills are. All I know is that you don't just learn leadership by reading a book or attending mm. a course. You pick up skills that you might not have otherwise considered. But one of the differences in a military career is you tend to be selected for entry as an officer having demonstrated leadership skills. So first of all, you've been Mm self-selected. And then virtually everything you do in a military career, and quite a lot in a career as a doctor, is acquiring leadership skills all the time, and you don't even know you're doing so. You're being led, you're watching leadership, you're leading people, you're not going on a course. It's live action, watching it and experiencing it throughout your career. So by the time you've done a... 34, 35-year career, you have been living and experiencing Mm. leadership. And I think that is the secret to understanding how to lead. You've actually (laughs) been acquiring tacit and experiential knowledge on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. And hopefully you learn some skills. (laughs) Um, And I do believe you have to have the right interpersonal skills. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whether it's adaptability is one of them. You've got to be ready to listen to people. Mm. Being Chairing a board is not being a director. Mm. It's actually listening, assimilating my the current board of which I chair. What a huge privilege. Incredibly capable and intelligent people. Um, I'm immensely privileged to have such a talent pool helping me to run this charity. We do it together. I happen to be the guy in the chair. In the best yeah. robes, by the way. <laughs> They're great robes. The, 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 the kit is good. Yes. <laughs> so we're here in the amazing building that you've just shown us. Um, you're currently the chair of St. John Ambulance. So what do you actually do in this capacity? And t- 
tell us more about this organisation? So, uh, this is uh, St John's Gate, which is uh, the headquarters building of what is known as the Priory of England and the Islands. The Order of St John, if you go back in history, extends back a thousand years, and this estate here, of which this is part of the residue, has been in this place just north of the city walls of London for nearly a thousand years. Wow. A turbulent history from the days of the Crusades through the adventures of the Knights through the Mediterranean, the siege of Malta, and included the dissolution of this priory as a dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII in the 16th century. The uh, Protestant order re-emerged in many countries in Northern Europe, but specifically in England in the 1870s, where those interested in the ancient values of the order, and I'll say that now, it's pro fide, pro utilitate hominum, for the faith and for the service of mankind, enduring for nearly a thousand years, wow. those same values, there was something that needed to be done about increasing injuries and uh, damage to people who were working in the mines and in industrial England of the 19th century. And they set up a training in first aid to provide a method of looking after each other in those industrial and very dangerous environments. Mm -hmm. And it gathered momentum swiftly. And a decision was needed as to how to transport these patients and the first vehicle a simple litter was designed which was called the St John Ambulance mm -hmm. to convey people around that is why we emphasize it's St John, St. Ambulance, John Ambulance not St John's Ambulance <laughs> as, we've, as, as we've discussed um, and this this message spread very very rapidly throughout the British Commonwealth mm -hmm. And uh, the, the need for first aid training and for ambulances gathered momentum. There was huge support from the royal family, particularly then Prince of Wales, and Queen Victoria granted royal charter as an order of chivalry of the British Crown, which it still is to this day. The organisation had a major impact with one of the largest field hospitals in northern France during World War I. And throughout the 20th century, had an impact in all aspects of life in up and down the countryside and towns of England as well as the rest of the UK and around the British Commonwealth. Which brings us to this day when we, uh, in England, this is the Priory of England, there are priories in 11 other countries around the world and smaller associations uh, reaching a total of 41 countries. Mm. We include, um, I say the word, iconic eye hospital, caring, the only provider of eye care for the Muslim population in East Jerusalem and the Palestinian territories, the St. John Eye Hospital, back to our roots. Um, small island states, larger countries in Africa, in effect a global humanitarian charity operating in 41 countries based upon our principles for the faith mm -hmm. and for the service of mankind. And it varies. So in some African countries, we have mother and baby clinics. In Canada, they have a wonderful uh, uh, care system of uh, dogs looking after people who need their support and help in nursing care and uh, friendship. Uh, to disaster relief in the Caribbean islands. Uh, and... Uh, in this country, uh, the biggest provider of first aid training, delivery of first aid care, the largest individual ambulance service, care for events, music, sport throughout the country, which could not happen without mm. our support, and care in the communities and uh, an ambition that we now have to build more work in communities to concentrate on supporting uh, young people from deprived backgrounds specifically, to bring them into pathways 
into healthcare and nursing, to train them to support their own communities so that the youngsters are develop, acquiring skills helped by us. By that method, they can mm. give back into their own communities and try to fill some of the gaps in provision in society that um, are so difficult to resource these days. And as a charity, which we are, uh, of course, um, uh, some people think sometimes that we're an arm of the government. Absolutely not. We're a charity. And our role is to provide charitable output, mm. often helped by the income we get from teaching first aid and going to some uh, big events. Uh, and to continue to make a difference in society. That's amazing. What an incredible organisation. And also how important it is to champion the younger generation to, t- to, to do their part as well, which is fantastic. You actually touched on the values of St John, but I'm wondering what values that you feel have driven you through your career and now has enabled you to have this role? Well, I guess I'm, um, I'm probably quite driven. Mm-hmm. I've never really thought of myself as ambitious. Others almost certainly do. I, I, I personally believe that I really want to do the very best in any role that I have. Mm-hmm. Maybe as a consequence I've subliminally been driving my own ambition. But uh, if you succeed in a role, perhaps that is the reward, if you, if you call it that. Uh, I'm um, obsessed with delivering what I'm asked to do, following through on my responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think a sense of duty and moral responsibility underpinned by uh, good, genuine Christian principles is um, a pretty safe way of committing yourself. I love that. You're clearly very committed to humanitarian causes. You're clearly committed to medicine and the impact that you make a difference on people's lives. But you're also, you touched on the beginning, about climate change. Can you tell me more about this, like particularly around medicine and climate change's impact on medicine? You've got some articles and books you've written about that. So what I try to talk about and share with people is a need to understand all of the complex interrelated issues that make this matter so critical today. So if I give an example, um, and in this instinct, the cause of climate change is almost irrelevant. We have had significant cyclical changes in the climate of our planet over the millennia we know, whether you call them ice ages or more or less extreme changes. In previous millennia, when there was a significant climate change, The population was relatively small and nomadic Mm. and mostly farming based and would comfortably move with the climate to better pastures, relocate as herds might do Mm. today and find places where they could resettle and build their families and cultures. (coughs) We now have a massive global population which is increasing inexorably, Mm. particularly in Africa, a population that is increasingly urbanised, therefore they can't move easily, and increasingly on built on cities on low-lying coastal plains. So if you combine the coastal population with urbanisation, and increasing population, you can see why climate change is absolutely catastrophic today. Absolutely. If you then look at the finite resources of our planet and look at the fact that there's going to have to be increasing competition for and demand for food and water and fuel, those they themselves are going to be the drivers of tension and stress and need by those very same populations. We as a species are, of course, providing additional harm ourselves to the planet, whether it is deforestation or distribution of plastics. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to recognise that the changes in our planet, as uh, so many people much greater than I are constantly telling us, David Attenborough, the Prince of Wales, the Royal Princes and others, this is a multifactorial issue 
And whilst the changes to carbon emissions are absolutely fundamental, we must look at all of the other issues and consider how to, for example, help to manage the expanding population in Africa, which itself is going to contribute to the adverse effects of climate change. And once we've looked at how to reduce all the other confounding impacts, we must think much more, not just about the cause, but if climate change is inexorable, even if we stick with agreed targets, then we've got to be putting much, much more effort into mitigating the impact of the climate change on our planet and uh, not only talking about the cause of climate carbon emissions. Mm. So, so the reason I... So all that preamble is that ultimately the problem is going to fall upon a medical profession with an increasingly diseased and sick population who, if we don't get it right... Uh, will suffer significantly as a result. There will be a uh, loss of life from both catastrophe and disease, starvation and water shortage. Mm. And we need to be thinking as a planet of the best ways of looking after this planet and the population to diminish these risks, taking into account all of those issues. And I believe that the medical profession uh, can collectively have a powerful part to play in supporting that. I think that's amazing, and I think that you're absolutely right, but I think everybody needs to take their role. And I, I think, unfortunately, we live in a world where some p- p- people, places, don't believe <laughs> that the issue is as, as um, problematic as it, it clearly is. On a smaller scale, let's go back down to minutia, um, what can people do, do you think, on a, you know, to contribute towards changing the, the planet, changing the world? doing their part. Yes, and, and I just come back to what you said. That, I mean, there are some people for whom, and, and this is probably a vast majority of the population of the world, who actually are simply, can only su- survive from day to day. Mm. So, so we have to recognise that those who haven't anything can't do very much. Yeah. Although what we can do is, and I'm thinking particularly about the vast populations in the African and Asian countries, We can work closely with governments to look at how to diminish population expansion and how to be more efficient in food production. That sounds very, this is very complicated. I'm not saying it isn't. But these are are global issues, recognising that many people in the world uh, can only do enough to survive themselves, let Mm. alone worry about the planet. And that that is not great, but it's understandable. On a... Uh, on an individual basis, I, I'm sure that we all need to think about our uh, every day, whether it's our carbon emissions, our use of plastics, our, our meat consumption, our holidays, everything we do every day. And if we're talking about the wealthier countries, um, we, we must think carefully as we move forwards. Mm. It's clear to me that you're absolutely fascinated by this and your passion really comes through uh, around climate change. I just think it's amazing. I think if we all did a s- small thing, we could change the world. Uh, so yeah, I'm yeah, just good a sentiment. Huge, yeah. huge advocate of that. We actually have a question from the audience for you. Drum roll, are you ready? I have to read it. So what changes within the Royal Navy, because obviously you've had a long career in the Royal Navy, do you see as having made the most significant difference during your time served? Well, so the immediate response is that I joined the Royal Navy um, in about 1974, a bit younger than no I am now. Way. Yes, <laughs> it's all about size. I mean, the size of the Royal Navy then was vast compared with today. So, if, you, if anyone says, you know, what's changed in the Royal Navy from the mid 70s to 20? Uh, 19 or perhaps when I left the Royal Navy 2012. Mm-hmm. It's all about size. Now, that it's, it's very difficult. You talk about numbers of ships, and of course, the difference is that a squadron of eight frigates in the 1970s would be less effective than one modern frigate destroyer today. Okay. So, so, but, but it is all about, so it's not so much about power and capability, although there is a substantial difference there. But um, the proportion of GDP spent on defence has reduced mm-hmm. uh, over those times. And so there's uh, a smaller navy 
far fewer people. I, I brought, was brought up uh, in my early part of a career when Plymouth and Portsmouth were big Navy towns. Everywhere you went down Union Street in Plymouth, there'd be sailors going in and out of the bars and pubs. There'd be the police patrols at night <laughs> taking people back to their ships. It just it doesn't happen like that any anymore. Um, and uh, there'd be the establishments of the Royal Navy throughout those two uh, naval cities were... Um, very large. So, so, so that's my sort of personal recollection of a navy mm. that is different. And of course, life as a young naval rating officer in those days revolved much more around a social environment and cohesion together, where the messes and the bars were places of social gathering. Mm. Youngsters, and yes, less young these days, don't tend to gather in the same way. So the life of a wardroom or a ship's mess or a wardroom mess, uh, or a, a, a sh- uh, establishment mess these days. I think in all three services, doesn't exist like what did. Mm. People now have private rooms where you're as likely to find members of the Royal Navy, Army and Air Force sitting in their room, mm. playing with their laptop, PC, watching a movie by themselves, communicating with their loved one by... Um, uh, like Skype, uh, by, by or, Skype or whatever. Yeah. And actually, the, the, the life of a mess, a wardroom, and three services has changed. So that's the first thing. So that's my observation. Um, and I, I probably shouldn't get me into the uh, sort of politics of defence <laughs> expenditure and our, our weight in the world. You can only imagine that I'm a passionate supporter of the importance of a powerful defence com- com- capability in our country. Yeah, absolutely, especially in the world that we are in. It's interesting though what you're touching on here is about community and actually when people think about the forces in general they think about the community and people join it to be a part of yes. something. But actually what you're saying is that's quite... Well I think they still do social. but the way yeah. the, the lifestyle has, has changed. changed. Yeah. Um, in, in a significant way, um, you'd go into uh, talk as an officer, uh, of course, into a wardroom. Lunch times, evenings, there yeah. was always a buzz of people there because that's yeah. where you congregated. Because that's what social life bit bit like. Yeah. I mean, it's no different from the uh, closure of uh, pubs day by day across the country. There's a reason yeah. for it. People's uh, social world has uh, has small, changed. Not, yeah, absolutely. So, going to draw this to a close, but I would like to just tap into all of the things you've talked about you talked about your values and things that drive you and how you love to deliver what is it that really the fundamental piece of advice that you'd say to others to kind of escalate their career and be like you what would it be oh. <laughs> <laughs> poor them <laughs> don't be like me <laughs> ask my wife <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's very difficult. I've been extraordinarily fortunate to, I would say, be in the right place at the right time to have um, a very privileged um, career. And uh, I'm afraid I think a bit of luck does go with it. Mm-hmm. And um, to just follow through and uh, follow your passion. I mean, you know, what is my passion? Frankly, I haven't touched on it. My family, you know, they, yeah, they are yeah. there for me. I have a wonderful uh, big family of an unusual life family these days. We live in a Hampshire village um, uh, in the countryside, um, uh, the family home that many of the kids were brought up in. My uh, eldest son lives in the next door village with his wife and their children. Eldest daughter lives in the same village oh, nice. with her husband and children. His mother lives in the same village. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful. We have a, uh, have a, have a lovely uh, family and um, uh, of course, that's what uh, brings your values uh, yeah, together absolutely. very strongly. Got a nice foundation there. Mm. Love it. Thank you so much for allowing us here today to chat to you. It's been an absolute font of knowledge for us, and we are truly thankful. Uh, just as a little shout out for St John Ambulance, is there anything you'd like to tell our audience that you need, want, desire, where they can find out more information about St John? Well, we need and want all the time. So, yes, anyone out there, we are always looking for uh, volunteers. Um, We've got our website, um, sja.org.uk. We are looking for volunteers all the time. Uh, The younger, the better. We have badges start at the age of seven Uh. all the way through. Um, so come and join us in your local communities uh, through through the website. You'll find methods of contacting. Of course, um, big message, we love to manage uh, people's lives better, train people in first aid, 
Go and learn how to use a defibrillator. Make sure you've got a defibrillator in your workplace, in your environment. Know where it is. Know how to use it. <laughs> uh, ultimately, we're a charity. Mm-hmm. We need donations to help us to make a difference in communities, to help those youngsters who uh, need our help, to help their communities, a cyclical process. But uh, the more donations we receive, the more charitable output we can deliver. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll put some links about how people can find out a bit more about St John Ambulance and a little bit more about why they can find out about you, but not Wikipedia. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Annalise, very much. Thanks for coming here.